Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our home church. Let's just prepare our heart toward heaven. Let's sing a song, holy song. Page 47, Angel We Have Heard on High. 47, Angel We Have Heard on High. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echo back their joyous strains. Sings my 
to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul.
February 11th, let's ask about the uh, Heavenly Father to your parents. Yongbe. Hello. Joint me in prayer. Sarage Hashinon, Hanani Maboji, Champomonin, Anyo Hashimonika. Most precious. A uh, heavy father, true parents. Good morning. We are so grateful to start a new day and new week. Every day, morning coming out, uh, and uh, uh, sun is coming out, and uh, sun is set. Each period of time, we are uh, growing. Each day is uh, like a hundred years or a million years for you. You created the whole creation with goodness and love. Yet, your children is, couldn't recognize you and recognize your creation. We are very sorry. We are denied in front of you. We repent and uh, we want to say sorry to you. Through the Christ, we learn and we, we can understand the more and the more. Please guide us, opening up our heart and mind to receive your word. Through your word, you can create us again to be your children. Today, new beginning of the heart, and also the uh, new um, new God's Day is coming soon, the February 16. We are preparing our heart and mind to reflect the year, and we can make a new start and a new beginning with sincere heart and loving heart. Please give us hint how to prepare our heart and our life and and uh, it can become the beautiful memory with you and uh, each other please bless this time to reflect and think think deeply and uh, cooperate your world with our life we want to be the the uh, past the make mistake we repent and uh, we want to make a new determination to very joyful and loving and caring to others through that uh, we can change the world. It's a loving, loving relationship. We know that uh, love and hate the mixing up inside of us and make difficulty the keeping anger toward each other and uh, breaking down the relationship and uh, through the individual, the family and society and nation, the world, that each relationship is broken down. Messiah came to the tell us truth, how to make relationship going to be beautiful, loving relationship. Through that, world will step by step will change please guide this time to how can create our heart and and our world can better place to be beautiful loving place please guide this time to our pastor giving the guidance from you and uh, can respect and uh, to be humble to receive please bless this time I report in the name of Raman and Tamiko Montanaro, blessed central family, Aju. Aju. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Please sit it and welcome our pastor Montanaro. So today, I want to um, spend some time with the divine principle 
this is the central teaching of the unification movement. Exposition of the divine principle is the uh, tr best translation, actually, than just divine principle. And actually, even the word divine is not in the original Korean. Wali Kangnon is the original title. And um, Wali means original. One is original in Chinese characters. And Ri, Ri, R-I, is principle or order or um, heavenly way. Uh, so, Wan Li is the original way, the original principle, and then Kang Non means exposition or teaching or lecture or some kind of, um, uh, exposition is a good translation. Exposition of the, of the original principle would be a good translation. But this is the translation that we, we use, and you should read the whole thing if you can. It's very dense. Um, you need some background in philosophy and in history and in religion to appreciate it fully. But you can read it as a launch, as a springboard for your study of history and religion and philosophy. So either way, whether you, whether you become a knowledgeable person about history, religion, and philosophy first and then read the divine principle, or read this first and then supplement that with all the historical and philosophical and religious documents that you want, and prayer. Either way, this is a great guidebook. And let's talk about an analogy here of a broken car. If you have an engine that's broken, what do you have to do? What do you have to do? Okay, if you're just sitting there in your driveway, it's not working, or you could have a towed away to some mechanic and he'll fix it for you. But let's just say you want to fix it yourself. What do you have to do? Since like you like cars, what are you going to do? Fix it, yeah. How do you fix it? What do you do? Is looking at it going to work? Tools. What? You need tools. You need tools, right? And what else? Yeah, you find the car. Find well, the you need a blueprint, right? You need the maybe the manual. What is it? The Haynes manual for that car breaks down every component, all the engineering specs, which tell the tolerances, the sizes, the the relationship between the parts, right? And then you need to take the engine apart. It's not going to get fixed if you just let it sit there, right? You take it apart. You find out which parts are broken, which parts are twisted, which parts are, are damaged or old, need to be replaced. And you fix them. You put a new part in or you, you engineer your own part. If you've got your own little shop, you can actually drill out, you know, bore out um, pistons. You can do everything. But the point is that if something's broken, you've got to take it apart to fix it, which may seem counterintuitive because if... Something's broken, you want to put it together, but the problem is if it's broken, you've got to find out what's wrong and you've got to take it apart. Father went into his own soul for 10 years, from the age of 15 until he was 25, praying deeply and understanding how human beings were created. He discovered not only the blueprint, which is the principle of creation, in the divine principle, there are many chapters, the principle of creation, the fall, human fall, eschatology and human history, the Messiah, his advent and the purpose of his second coming, resurrection, predestination, Christology, that's the first part. Part two has the introduction to restoration, um, the providence lay the foundation for restoration, which is the first three families of Adam's family, Noah's family, and Abraham's family. Then Moses and Jesus, um, periods, of time and providential history, and how their length was determined, the parallels between the, essentially the different periods in history, um, especially the Jewish and Christian histories, the period of preparation for the second advent of the Messiah, basically the last 400 or 500 years of history, how God was using that history to set up the whole world to receive the Messiah, and finally the second advent, second coming. That's the divine principle. We're going to look at the first chapter the principle of creation today, because if you look at a blueprint, that's what a principle of creation is. It's how and why God created human beings and the universe. Then, looking at that blueprint, we can look at the car, or the, in this case, human beings, and see, oh, what's wrong? What's broken? Then, we can take ourselves apart. And this is not a comfortable thing. Everybody wants to be together, you know? He's got it together is in a way of saying, that's an expression, right? That means he's 
you know, working, he's functioning well. He's uh, a productive member of society, right? He's got it all together. The opposite would be, he's falling apart, man. You know, <laughs> you're really falling apart. Right? But if you want to take, if you want to fix a broken engine, you've got to take it apart. It's got to fall apart. You've got to take it apart. That means you have to go into sort of like a hospital almost, like a mental or spiritual hospital. I'm not saying mental hospital here, but <laughs> you have to go, you have to allow yourself to go in the shop. That's what a religious life is. Some people, in fact, don't want to follow a religious life because they want to be all together. They want to be cool. They want to have it all together. But if you really recognize and you're humble enough, last week we talked about humility, mm -hmm. right? The humility to fix yourself. If you're humble enough to recognize that something's wrong, mm -hmm. then you have to give yourself time every day, every week, every month, every year to fix yourself. That means to take yourself apart. And it's very courageous, actually. Religious people are more courageous. Marx thought religion was the opium of the people, a drug taken to not actually face reality. But we know that true religion, now maybe false religion can be a drug if you just go there to look good and to make FaceTime with your friends and to hang out and to sort of, you know, be cool. Then it's not religion. That's not religion. That's not true religion. That's um, maybe just ritual and, you know, ceremony and liturgy and, again, part of being in society. And Christianity is so powerful and so popular in America today that it's very popular to be Christian. And it's very a sign of that you're a good member of society. So are we, we cannot always trust people's protestations of faith. I am a Christian. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. That's great. That's great. If you do, that's fantastic. But if you're truly religious, you're giving yourself time every day, every week, every month, every year. And my wife was talking about the Chinese New Year's coming up. And we celebrate God's Day, the first day of the year. You can celebrate it on New Year's Day, January 1st. And in this case, the Chinese or Asian calendar would celebrate it this Friday, I believe it is, is February 16th. Is that right? Is Friday? Yeah. So... Friday, February 16th, you can maybe start the new year, the Chinese year, with reflection and prayer. Let yourself be taken apart a little bit. Take yourself apart. Look deeper. What's working? What's not? Offer those things that are not working to God. Not so that God can fix them for you. Because ultimately the responsibility to fix ourselves lies with who? Yes. Me. But I need God's help. I need God's guidance. And this book can help a lot. Because Father went deeper than any man in history to take himself apart, to take apart human history, to dig deep into the spiritual undercurrents of history, and to reveal where sin lay, where the breakdown lay, and to fix it. He came out from that 10-year journey ready to help mankind. But he was not welcomed because as any prophet, any saint, any great religious leader has found, human society built upon people trying to look cool and keep it all together rejects people easily who are asking you to take yourself apart, not look cool, be humble, take yourself apart, analyze, look at your sin, look at what's wrong and fix it. I don't need fixing, I'm cool. That's the response that many strong, powerful people will have. And the leaders of our society, the ones who control society, are the most likely to be in denial about any situation that's going on in their own lives that needs looking at. Until they get discovered in bed with a prostitute or a, a page boy or, you know, until all the sexual misconduct comes out, until the bribery and the financial dealings get revealed. They don't want to reveal. They never confess it. They get caught misusing money, misusing love, misusing people and their power. And then, oh, in disgrace, they come penitent in front of the camera. I, have, I apologize. I've, I've misused the trust of the American people. And blah, 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 blah. Nonsense. It's not real repentance. They're forced to it. Many times they're trying to preserve their precious career 
as a politician or as a banking leader or as a political leader or an economic leader or religious leader. And those same powerful, dishonest, in disingenuous people are the ones who have the control. So when a prophet or a great saint or a religious leader who's true comes and speaks truth to power, many times the power tries to crush the truth. It happened with Jesus. It happened with Moses. It happened with Abraham. It happened with uh, Joshua. It happened with, well, Joshua not so much. It happened with uh, Jacob's, Jacob. It happened with Jacob's son, Joseph. His brothers tried to kill him and then sold him into slavery for speaking the truth, right? The dreams he had, Joseph and the coat of many colors, right? Every great man, all the prophets were stoned and killed and attacked. So to see that Reverend Moon's life was a series of attacks on him by powerful people should not surprise us and in fact should tell us, aha, maybe there's truth here. And you should go and find that truth. If you're really a truth seeker. And I hope if you're watching these videos, you are a truth seeker. Anyway, here's what we're talking about. That was all a preamble to talk about why we need this book. Okay. What we want to talk about today is in the principle of creation. So we're taking apart the engine, right? We're taking apart life. To find out what is the core, fundamental truth of the universe... And how did that get violated by the fall? How are we still violating truth in the way we live today? And in one word, the answer is sex. Sexual love, and this is, I'm not going to talk about this from a personality point of view or a political point of view. This is from a principled point of view about how God created the universe. God, we can tell how, how the nature of God, because God created the universe in God's own image. We see that everything in the creation has masculine and feminine attributes. Man and woman, male and female and animals, ma um, stamen and pistol, masculine and feminine parts of plants. Then even in the subatomic world, we see molecules have cation and anion, um, positively charged atoms, negatively charged atoms. Then we have, in the atom itself, within the atom, we find proton and electron, positive and negative charges. Even in the realm of muons and quarks and all the different uh, subatomic particles that make up protons and electrons, we find positive and negative. That tells us that this is a principle that exists in the fundamental core of the universe. Mm -hmm. To say that homosexuality is wrong is not an opinion. It is not a a politically charged statement. You may wish to make it so. You may wish to say, oh, that Montanaro fellow, he's attacking homosexuals. I'm not. I'm simply saying that the universe was built, designed, with the idea of masculine and feminine on every level. To say that that is not true puts you in a minority. A dangerous minority, actually. You are violating the principle that God used to create the universe. But that is not the most fundamental attribute. Internal and external is the most fundamental. God has within God's own nature internal qualities that are intangible, you can say, that are heart, intellect, emotion, will, the qualities that make a personality. And then God has energy or the power to express those feelings, thoughts, and emotions, and desires in reality. God then created everything with some image of that, internal and external, as the form of mind and body in human beings. Every human being has a mind, which is invisible, and a body, which expresses the mind. Mm -hmm. Animals have an instinctive mind and a body which expresses that mind. Plants have a tropic, a tropism-based mind, which guides the growth of the plant, and a body, a cell body, which expresses that mind. Even molecules and atoms and particles have an inherent directive nature, an invisible nature, which science cannot discover where it comes from, and yet that directs the physical matter that make up 
the protons, electrons, atoms, and molecules. Otherwise, there would not be protons and electrons, because we know that the universe is fundamentally energy. Energy doesn't have masculinity. Energy doesn't, I should say, not say that. It does have masculine and femininity, but when we talk about a big bang, an explosion of energy and matter, when we talk about E equals MC squared, when we look at energy, heat, it is not characterized by protons and electrons. How does a proton form? What forms a proton? What forms an electron? What forms an atom? What makes two atoms come together to form a molecule? There's, there's intelligence there, design. Beautiful, beautiful, intelligent design. There's principle involved. But, but where is that principle located if all you are is a materialist, if you're a scientific materialist and you say there's nothing that exists that cannot be measured, then where is that design and how do you measure that design? You see the problem that I'm talking about here in terms of physics? Yeah. You're saying that there exists design, that these things have come together in certain intelligent and predictable patterns and yet you cannot identify and measure the force that is causing that energy to coalesce into matter. You are being unscientific if you say that that does not exist, that force does not exist. And yet you can't measure it. Because mind is immeasurable. The internal quality is immeasurable. It's not measurable. This is where science's greatest weakness lies. It says, we can solve all the problems in the universe, except half of the universe. <laughs> I can't talk about that. And in fact, let's not talk about that. That's unscientific. Well, okay, it may not be scientific in the sense that you cannot measure it, but it doesn't mean it's not real. Mind is real. And what is subject? Did the mind, is the mind subject over the body or the body subject over the mind? Does the mind control the body or the body control the mind? Well, there's a give and take between internal and external. They relate back and forth. But the subjective element, meaning the initiative element, comes from the mind. Yeah. There are involuntary processes in the body that we don't control with our mind directly. Like animals, instinctive nature. We go to the bathroom, we eat, we reproduce, we sleep, we grow. These are things that we don't control. But we see that the mind controls the body because even the movement, look at me speaking. Is my body speaking? Is a bunch of cells speaking, thinking and speaking? Do you see the, the paradox here? You, if you say, if you're a true materialist, you say this body just met, you know, grew through evolution, through random evolution of survival of the fittest or whatever principle you choose to believe that could somehow create something so incredibly brilliant in just 15 billion years, that this matter and energy is speaking and thinking and loving and desiring and doing means that matter and energy itself has within it mind which you don't want to admit, or that mind exists independently or above matter and is controlling it, also which you don't want to admit. You're stuck. <laughs> when you see a human being speaking, if you're really honest, you'll recognize that everything we do as human beings, when I move my hand, I say, move. The hand moves. Close. I'm controlling matter. Is the brain somehow deciding, spark plugging, like open that, close that? No, it's a desire. I want to open my hand, I close my hand. There is an invisible desire controlling my brain, controlling my body. My brain is not controlling my hand. Yes, it is indirectly, but what's controlling my brain to tell me to open or close the hand? Think about it, please. I'm not speaking unscientifically here. This is the basis of faith, actually. That mind exists independently and, in a sense, before matter. Okay, now we're going deeper. So if everything exists in mind and body, has a mind-body relationship, which is subject, which is object? Mind, the internal part, is subject. And the, bo the body, the physical part, is in the object position. There's a relationship between the two. Okay. 
That's God's nature. God created everything with that nature. So we all have the same quality. Now, this is where the principle gets really deep. And I'm not going to pretend that I even understand it completely. I'm still praying. For 38 years I've been praying about this point. But I want to share it with you. And then we want to talk about society and where we're broken. What is the relationship? First of all, what is God's nature? God is a harmonized being of the dual qualities of masculine and feminine, internal and external. God is a parent. How did God create? God separated God's dual qualities in creation to create discrete bodies or, or separate entities that represent each of the qualities that are united within God. When God created man and woman, he separated God's own masculine and feminine nature into masculine and feminine beings. Then through give and take, those things come together and become the image of God. Then God, the principle says, and I can just read it to you, let's just read it. In light of our understanding, this is page 20 of the principle of creation, in light of our understanding of the dual characteristics, the relationship between God and the universe, now we're jumping, we're, we're not just talking about inside of God, now we're talking about the relationship between God and the universe, can be summarized thus. The universe as a whole is a substantial object partner to God. It is composed of individual embodiments of truth, each a unique manifestation of the dual characteristics of God at either the level of image, human beings, or symbol, the rest of creation. So, God is the subject partner, and the universe is God's object partner. But subject and object also have the quality of masculine and feminine. So God is the internal masculine subject to the universe, which is God's external feminine object. So in relation to the universe, God is masculine. Because God has the quality of giving love first, which is masculine. So we emphasize this masculine relationship with the universe by calling God Father. Within God, God's got the dual characteristics and harmony, though. The universe was created as God's feminine object. In a sense, the internal God wants to marry the external God, the universe. That, that creates a relationship. We come out of the universe, human beings, and we're in the image of God, and God wants to dwell in us, but the masculine quality of God relates better to men. And the feminine quality of God relates better to women. The masculine, see, we're getting deep here, right? The masculine quality of God is subjective, internal. The feminine quality is objective, external. In the relationship between love and beauty, masculine quality is what gives love. The feminine quality is what returns beauty. So men and women represent God and the universe on a certain level. Which is supported by the Bible verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7, when Paul states that man is the image and glory of God and woman is the image and glory of man. It's very deep because it depends on what angle you look at it from what relationship you're talking about. Is it between God and human beings, God and the universe, man and woman? But it's important to recognize that there are differences and that they stem from God's nature. Man is the image and glory of God, Paul says. Meaning I'm more masculine as a man and my wife is more feminine. So she's like the universe and I'm like God, loving the universe. Our children are like human beings that are like the children of the universe and God's love. Human beings are like the children 
of the universe is like a woman, and God is like the man loving the universe, and the universe got pregnant and gave birth to human beings. We are God's children. We're not like the other creation, created things. We're not exactly like the other created things. We love them because they are created in God's image or likeness. They're created in God's symbolic image. Like uh, the animals, dogs, horses, we love them because you can see almost human qualities in them at times. And all animals ex exhibit the relation, the, the nature of God, but it's symbolic. It's part of the universe. We are part of the universe too, in a certain sense, especially our bodies. But our mind, and this is where it gets really deep, our mind is supposed to become the dwelling place of God on Earth. In other words, unlike the rest of the universe which God is, is God's feminine object, and God is a masculine subject. God wants to dwell within human beings as his children. And when the masculine God wants to dwell within a man and a woman, where is he going to dwell more likely? The man or the woman? Man. In the man. Because the man's nature as subjective is like the creative aspect or the masculine aspect of God. But when God dwells in the man, what's God's attention going to completely go toward then? The woman. So the man will honor and love and pour himself into the woman. That's why men get obsessed with women. Because a woman is like the universe to God. And God's entire attention and energy flow into the universe. So which is it better to be, a man or a woman? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Both have equal value. Because they're both participants and they share in this magical, amazing mystery of love. But if we go the route of homosexuality, we violate this. We leave behind this mystery, this magic. And we retreat like cowards into a man-man relationship or a woman-woman relationship which cannot embody this mystery of the universe. It cannot become an object of God's love. We are denying our true self. And if anyone is to speak the truth, they have to speak this truth. This is not emotional. This is not persecuting homosexuals in any way. Actually, the opposite is true. In our modern society, if you say words like this, that homosexuality is a violation of the original principle by which God created the universe, you become the target of the homosexual hit squad. Right? We have political forces now, very powerful political forces, that are trying to destroy anyone who says words like this. It becomes very politically charged. You're taking away my human rights. I'm not. No, I'm just speaking truth. You have a freedom to follow the truth or not follow the truth. But if you don't follow the truth, you'll be destroyed by your own actions. Yes, you can deny that the principle of gravity exists. And while you're standing on safe ground, you can blah, 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 blah. Gravity doesn't exist. But if you choose to test out your belief that gravity doesn't exist by walking off a cliff, I'm not responsible anymore for what happens to you. I told you gravity exists. I've told you that it pulls two bodies together at the speed of the, the rate of acceleration due to the rate of gravity. 9.8 meters per second per second. You're going to speed up until you get maximum velocity and then you go splat. You can deny it. 
But it doesn't change the fact that the principle exists. The principle of the universe exists by which falling bodies accelerate until they go splat. You can deny that men and women were created for each other. And you can try to follow a homosexual lifestyle. Man and man, woman and woman. But you will go splat. When you get older, especially, you see the, the sadness of older homosexual men and women. Especially, they, they, you know, there's a dryness. and a, I'm sorry. But you can see, I see great sadness. But, but there's still love in every human being, and God exists, and God loves us all. But it is not a heavenly or a true lifestyle. It's not a true lifestyle. Now what about those of us who choose not to become homosexual and want to pursue man-woman relationships? There is order in that also. It's not a free-for-all just because you're following man and woman. No, quite the opposite. You must become one with God to fully experience the original nature of that man-woman relationship. So homosexuals have a, an accurate and an honest and a valid criticism of heterosexual couples that misuse each other, fight, hurt each other. And many of them, and this is why I think it's very important uh, for homosexuals to listen to what I'm saying and to begin to look at, ad address the brokenness, that most homosexuals would look at their parents and say that there was not a healthy relationship between man and woman. And all of us probably can look at our parents' relationship and see that there were moments, if not whole eras, epochs of time when our parents were dysfunctional. So by saying that a man-woman relationship is the image of God, I'm not saying that every man-woman relationship, or any of them actually, are really exhibiting that quality of oneness with God. I'm simply saying that if you want to take apart the engine and fix it, you better have a blueprint. And that blueprint says that your goal, your, your final goal when you fix that engine is a man-woman relationship, in a loving relationship with each other, in harmony with God. That's where we're going. There are many distractions and detours. And the sort of playboy promiscuous lifestyle we see in 20-somethings in our society, in teenagers and 20-somethings, while they're all sexy and pretty and they have nice bodies and they're just using that time to play with sex, to enjoy the physical pleasure that sex brings without any responsibility, is also evil. I'm going to be very clear, it's evil and it's wrong. Until you are ready to commit yourself to one person and work out that man-woman paradigm for eternity with that one person, you should abstain from sexual relationship. You should not be going into sexual relationship. That is the fruit of a man-woman relationship that has grown into oneness with God. It should be reserved for that. That's hard also. So my words today are not easy for anyone, are they? I'm not saying there's an easy way out. All of us have to work on our issues. The mess that we have find in our own heart when we think of the man-woman relationship. Some people, in fact, look at that mess and say, that's too much for me to deal with. I want to be homosexual. But that's not solving the problem. But others look at the man-woman relationship and say, I'll just treat it in a shallow way, I'll just have sex. But that's not solving the problem. That's creating more problems. Finally, by looking at that relationship, man-woman relationship, you take ownership of your mess. You pray deeply. You dig in your own soul. And you finally make a decision to become one with God. And you cry and shed tears and heal. And we can go back to other sermons and talk about the healing process. 
And then you qualify yourself to become a partner in love. And then you're ready to tackle the man-woman relationship. So that's my sermon for today. I just want you guys to think deeply about the man-woman relationship. And we're all at different ages. Some of you have been in a relationship for many years. And maybe taking it apart means willingly talking to each other and saying, you know what, maybe we should spend six months celibate or four, 40 days even. A good, good uh, number, right, from the Bible. Let's do 40-day abstention, like a 40-day fast, a uh, sexual fast. Some couples choose to do that. For 40 days, they, they don't have any relationship because what they want to do is dig inside their relationship with God and go deeper. Whatever you choose to do, um, you know, I hope it works for you to go deeper, to come connect to God more, and to feel the original joy and happiness that God feels when He sees His, His true children. That's what we want to live our lives in, that original joy and happiness. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We are grateful that we were created in your image as your children, that we were created out of this universe, which is like the mother of all of us. And you're like our father who loved the mother and gave birth then through that love relationship to your children. And we're then to become one with you and you can be embodied in us. That as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that God's spirit dwells in you? Paul understood. Jesus understood this. He said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. We should all be able to say this, Father. I and the Father are one. And maybe women, then, as the daughters of, of the universe and of you, can say, I and my mother are one. The universal mother. But then, I have to be one with my husband, who is like the center of the universe for me, God. Then, a man and a woman can become one. The man can say, I and my father are one. And the woman, as the queen of all the object beings in creation, can say, I and my mother are one. And then the man can love his wife and say, I love you like God loves the universe. And the woman can say, I receive your love the way that the universe receives the love of God. And I give birth to children the way the universe gave birth to humanity. And... We then, as man and woman, participate as like the nucleus of the entire universe and the relationship between God and the universe. Father, the mystery of this is beyond us, but it's amazing and we pray that we can understand how we are meant to be your sons and daughters and fulfill our true identity as your sons and daughters in this universe. I pray that this teaching can spread over the whole world and that all human beings can grow and enjoy as they experience your original love and ideal. Thank you so much. I ask your blessing on this day and I offer this report in the name of Raman and Tamiko Montanaro, a blessed central family. Chukpok Chungshim Kajang. Raman wa Tamiko Montanaro Iramuro Pogo Dermida. Aju. Amen. Okay, thank you. So grab a songbook and page whatever that song was on, the last one. Uh, in the kingdom of our hearts, which one was it? Take me through the doorway. Page 176. We'll sing the whole song again one time. Here we go. In the kingdom of our hearts where dreams like rivers flow Lives a man of many years, he's always there you know When the lights have all gone out and you are snug in bed On a journey to the kingdom we are softly led Yeah.
Thank you, everybody. Have a great week.